Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, we're going to be talking about robotic pyeloplasty today, which I don't think is a uh, new topic for anyone in here. So we'll be quick and um, hopefully generate some thought. I have no disclosures. Um, so classically, ureteral pelvic junction obstruction can be defined as congenital or acquired. You know, for congenital, uh, we have atretic segments, uh, which we don't really know exactly why these form uh, histopathologically. They look similar to, you know, pri <clears throat> primary mega ureter in, in kids where there's a, you know, a fibrotic replacement of the, um, uh, of the musculature. Crossing vessels, you know, these are uh, anatomic variants from the, uh, from the renal artery or from the aorta. Uh, and then we can, there can also just be high insertion or folds. Uh, typically, these can be seen in um, anatomic variants such as renal ectopia or horseshoe kidney, although they can also be in normally formed uh, kidneys as well. And just like we've seen in the last two presentations, uh, these can also be just from acquired ureteral stricture disease. Um, so important to note and kind of going along with the themes of everything we've seen in this, uh, this whole meeting, you know, when is, uh, when is less more? Not all UPJOs need to be, need to be fixed. Um, you know, I think uh, in this day and age, pretty much everyone has a nuclear medicine scan, pretty much everyone has cross-sectional imaging, but we need to couple our radiographic findings with our clinical findings. And you, know, you really want to make sure you're going to be helping someone when you're doing surgery on them. Uh, so typically, patients should be describing local symptoms, infection, or demonstrable decreasing uh, renal function. And I think also, you know, keeping your patient in mind, uh, obviously, if they have a good contralateral uh, kidney, you know, if their function's under 15%, uh, you really have to consider their surgical history, their medical history, uh, and make sure we're not going to be causing more morbidity than, than a help. Um, I do think if you are going forward with reconstruction, your ureteral rest is critical. Um, this is the same paper that we had seen uh, earlier. So I think, you know, when you're approaching a pyeloplasty, really understanding the patient, but also what you're up against is, is critical. You know, we talked about the nuclear medicine scan, we talked about cross-sectional imaging, but I think having great fluoroscopic imaging, anti-grade and retrograde, is also critical to understand are you dealing with an obliterative process, are you dealing with a narrowed process, how long of a segment are we up against? And because I think after you understand that data, you know, and, and intraoperatively things may change, but going in with a plan is always a good idea. And I think you can kind of think about pyeloplasty as a transacting approach or a non-transecting approach. So classically, um, we all have probably done dismembered anderson Hines uh, pyeloplasties. Uh, Zeho just gave a nice talk on augmented anastomotic. Um, and you know, these are really um, our choices when there's a crossing vessel. Um, you could also consider non-transecting even in the primary setting. I know um, Dr. Reeser is about to give a talk on failures, um, which you know maybe some of these non-transecting approaches may be a little bit more uh, utilized. Um, but you can also consider non-transecting in the primary setting, and I think there's been some uh, really nice videos on Twitter in the last uh, couple months uh, showing this. Um, there's a couple different techniques for that, and I'm going to be uh, showing an example of a, of a YV plasty. Um, so just to quickly mention positioning and access, um, you know, before the robotic positioning is very similar to, you know, partial or nephrectomy uh, in flank, and uh, you can use four robotic arms or three. Um, I typically just use one five millimeter uh, air seal assist, and you can put the needles in uh, through the eight millimeter ports. It's a little bit annoying, but it saves a bigger incision. Um, before actually getting the robotic portion, I typically like to start in lithotomy and do repeat imaging. Not for everyone, uh, but if it's been, you know, eight weeks with no stent, I want to see what I'm up against. Uh, I think that does change, uh, you know, kind of your structure quality or, or length. And again, you kind of want to have a plan going into this. Um, I typically like to set the ureteral catheter just below the stricture, uh, and that allows your bedside assistant to pass a wire and things like that. Um, Zeho showed an example of parking the ureteroscope. Uh, you can use the light from the ureteroscope on your Firefly, and that can sometimes help with, with localization. Um, everyone's probably seen this picture before uh, from Campbell's. Uh, so basically kind of uh, the classic anderson Hines dismembered pyeloplasty. You have uh, a crossing vessel there that's pushed your UPJ posteriorly. You make an incision. You transpose that ureter anteriorly, and you can put it back together. So just wanted to show a brief video, trying to keep it short here. Um, and just talk about some principles as we look at this. We kind of have our lower pole uh, artery dissected out. Uh, we see kind of where uh, there's an obstruction. Um, we're going to just gonna come across the, the ureter. I think it's important to, you know, we don't have proof that, you know, no touch is, is the best way to go, but I think it probably matters, with, especially with how strong these robotic instruments are. You want to avoid any crush injury, not just to the ureter, but also to the, you know, circumferential blood supply. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, you know, suture choices. I uh, typically use a 5.0 monocrylon on a TF. 
Uh, me and Zio were trained by the same person. So, uh, but also Foro Vicryl, Foro Stratifix, um, or the PS2 needle, all are good choices. I think what, what's more important is getting good stitches down. Um, and these posterior stitches are by far the most important. And it's just difficult because they're, nothing's fixed yet, right? And you really want to try to avoid grabbing onto the ureter. Once you kind of get these posterior down, it's a little bit easier because you can use the suture. Uh, here we just pass the, the stent down. Um, and I don't show it, but after the stent is, uh, you know, appropriately placed, we'll finish the anterior portion of the anastomosis. Um, I typically like to try to have the bedside assistant do a cysto before the end of the case just to see if the stent is down. Um, you can still adjust it while you're doing the anterior portion of the anastomosis. If not, yeah, you're going to have to go fishing for it or do a ureter ureteroscopy to get it out in the future. Um, sometimes that's difficult and, and not possible. Um, looking at a YV, a Foley non-transecting pyeloplasty, you know, these are classically described for a high insertion of a ureter, short stricture, small renal pelvis, and this is the picture from Campbell's, but also it's been shown that you can do these with a much more dilated, bigger renal pelvis uh, with a um, concurrent uh, reduction pyeloplasty. Um, you know, this is really not an option if, you, if it's an obliterative structure. Again, you're making a nice long longitudinal uh, ureterotomy, uh, and you want to have really healthy tissue there. It can be done. Uh, and the picture is a little bit um, tough to follow, but basically you're making a, a Y incision and you're closing it as a V, hence the name of the, uh, of the technique. And really the benefit of all these uh, non-transecting ureteroplasty techniques are borrowed from our lower tract surgeons, and the, you know, the uh, benefit is theoretically kind of preservation of that circumferential blood supply. I'll show a quick video here. Uh, this is from Dan Oon, I appreciate the, uh, this is from, from residency, so I appreciate the uh, permission to use it from him. Um, so he makes a long uh, longitudinal incision down the, uh, down the ureter, and now this is kind of the top part of the Y incision on the renal pelvis. And you notice this is very generous, you know. Um, you're gonna take the vertex of that Y and, and bring it down to create the V. So the vertex of the flap comes all the way down to the most distal portion of your longitudinal ureterotomy. And once you get this down, now you basically just have a medial side to close and you have a lateral side to close. It's uh, fairly straightforward. Um, so I just show one side for the, uh, for the sake of time here. Um, but it comes together pretty nicely. Uh, place the stent uh, before finishing the anastomosis. Um, and it's a fairly straightforward um, procedure. All right, um, you know, about approaches, I mean, I think, um, as we've seen in some uh, videos, this, set, uh, this, this whole meeting, you know, it's really awesome being able to approach the retroperitoneum in, in a multitude of ways. You know, I think you can approach a primary apply a pyeloplasty transperitoneal, you can approach a retroperitoneal. Uh, having the retroperitoneal skill set is nice if uh, there's a hostile abdomen or just to avoid peritoneal violation. Um, the SP platform has really made uh, this, you know, this view, it lends itself well to the retro. Uh, this is a picture just from Dr. Kayuk's group at Cleveland Clinic uh, in a pediatric patient or series, uh, and you see kind of this low anterior uh, access, how well it kind of shows you that retroperitoneal anatomy. Um, just quickly talk, commenting on the post-operative uh, management. I think if you're comfortable with your repair and the tissue quality, especially in a primary pyeloplasty, no drain is needed. There's obviously no harm in leaving one for a short period of time. Uh, we did see some data on stent versus no stent, so I won't go into that, uh, especially being very, very early in my career. I still leave one <laughs> or want to leave one. Uh, I think a stent for four to six weeks is prudent. Uh, get, like, like to get a MAG3 scan at about three months and then ultrasound one to two years post-operatively. Again, we don't really know um, you know, most failures probably will happen within a year uh, to two years, certainly, but we don't really know an exact end point when we should stop following these patients. Uh, just to some takeaways, uh, polyplasty is a durable operation. We should follow reconstructive principles when we do them. There are many technical approaches to a primary pyeloplasty. Um, you know, you can consider uh, incorporating some non-transecting techniques into your armamentarium. Um, and this is accessible via multiple anatomic approaches as well as platforms. Um, and I think you should do whatever is best for the patient and you're most comfortable with. Thank you guys for your time.